I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Jude, but we're also going to go to Romans chapter 8, so you may want to mark that. The book of Jude, my message is entitled this morning, Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Beloved, the Holy Spirit is our divine prayer partner. Amen? He's the one who initiates our desire to pray. And few Christians, sadly, are even aware of the fact that he does that, so they don't ask for his help or his, his uh, leading. Now, this is a very important message, what I'm going to speak to you uh, today. Anybody who's involved with theology knows what I'm speaking about in the times in which we live. So I want you to pay, pay close attention, beloved. I'm going to try to stay within the time. Uh, I'm going to stick close to my notes uh, so I don't uh, go off track so we can get to uh, fellowship and have some chili. <laughs> okay. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude, the book of Jude, verse 20, one verse. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Praying in the Holy Ghost. And I invite my Pentecostal and charismatic brethren to tune in. Jude says, But ye, beloved, praying, excuse me, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Perhaps a more controversial subject in these last days than ever was before has been, uh, has a, this verse or this last phrase made within the church of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the throne of grace. Holy Spirit, Father, we pray that you'd open up the eyes of our understanding. Oh God, show us the truth, the clear, the plain, the unadulterated truth. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, this is what we want to see. Let it shine on the truth. Lord, I pray you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Give me physical strength this morning, as well as phys- uh, spiritual anointing, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Now, as you well know, Jude is the Lord's half-brother. And throughout his epistle, as I've taught you before, he's been warning his readers about the danger of apostasy. And, beloved, he uses to remind these people of the punitive consequences and the judgments of all those who are unrighteous and ungodly people that are on this earth, both then in his time and also now in these last days who apostatize from the faith. But after describing the ungodly characteristics of apostates, Jews also assures his readers, praise the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. Would you say Amen. Beloved, he's coming back not only to judge apostates, but also also to rescue and shower the godly with his infinite mercies. And look what he says in verse 21. Keep yourselves on the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, unto eternal life. So he's coming back not only to give us these great mercies, but one of those great mercies is to grant us eternal life. Would you say amen out there? So therefore, beloved, he now exhorts them to be building themselves up, he says, in their most holy faith. Now, what does he mean by that? He means the whole body of truth, all of the fundamental, orthodox, cardinal doctrines of the faith that have been taught and revealed in the Holy Scriptures, taught by the Lord Jesus Christ, taught by the apostles, taught by the prophets, beloved, and also on how to live according to them. Would you say amen out there? Now, Jude says that one of the ways that we can Uh, be building up ourselves in this most holy faith, is being or learning how to pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, that's very important, beloved. You want to hear this message. (coughs) Excuse me. Look at verse 20. He says, But ye, beloved, building yourselves up. Notice this is the the verb there. We're something we're going to be constantly and continuously doing. On your most holy faith, praying in He says the Holy Ghost. So today my sermon, I want to focus on what it truly means to pray in the Holy Ghost, beloved. There is much misunderstanding today about this phrase. And it's amazing because the face of Christianity today, evangelical Christianity, is the Pentecostal and charismatic movement. And that's why uh, I believe that the, we have departed from the historic Orthodox Christian faith and what the true meaning of this means. And I'm going to teach you that today, beloved. So unlike what the Pentecostal charismatic movement claims and teaches, beloved, 
Praying in the Holy Ghost does not mean to speak, speak tongues. Praying in the Holy Ghost does not mean to speak with a heavenly or angelic prayer language. Praying in the Holy Ghost does not mean to speak with vain repetitions of ecstatic gibberish or syllables that are repeated over and over and over again. That is not what this is speaking about. And by the way, that is not praying in tongues. Tongues is xenophobia in the scriptures, real, actual, literal, foreign languages spoken in the world. You knew before, but God gave it to you as a gift. Would you say amen out there? So I'm saying despite the Pentecostal and charismatic claims and misinterpretation, even though I love my brethren, despite their misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 14, Scripture nowhere teaches that such nonsense is praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost is not speaking about a so-called ecstatic, ecstatic prayer language, beloved, that is supposedly given to all believers. Scripture clearly refutes that heresy. The Bible says God does not give the gift of tongues to all people. It's a clear statement of Scripture. Would you say amen? But praying in the Holy Ghost is a call. It's a command to pray consistently under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, under the direction and influence of the Holy Spirit, under the control and power and leading of the Holy Spirit. Prayer is our lifeline to heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, prayer is the only way to ever communicate and converse with God. Prayer is our means of connecting with God and receiving His supernatural help and aid and assistance in our life. What are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying that prayer is a vital factor in the Christian's life and experience for it accesses and activates all of its heaven's resources and all God's superabundant blessings, benefits, and bounties in our life. Would you say amen out there? Listen to me now. I want you paying attention. I don't want to lose you now. Don't let your mind drift. Yet few Christians regularly pray in the Holy Ghost. Yet few Christians daily pray, beloved. Yet few Christians earnestly and fervently pray in the Holy Ghost. They don't have a secret prayer clause. They don't see prayer as being important. They don't seem to think that it really changes anything, when the fact is, it changes everything. Would you say amen? You see, they don't know how to really beseech the throne of God and get a hold of the horns of the altar and not let it go until God miraculously helps them in their life. Why? Because they don't pray with importunity. Why? Because they don't pray believing that they'll receive what they're praying for. Oh, beloved, they need to pray like that uh, demon-possessed boy's father in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, when uh, he asked Jesus to cast that demon out. And he says, Jesus said, do you believe? He says, oh, Lord, help thou mine unbelief. And that's what we need here today as we learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Why, beloved? Listen to me now. We need to, uh, they don't pray without ceasing. And most importantly, they don't pray in the Holy Ghost. You see, beloved, they pray in their own feeble strength and power. And a lot of people pray in their own feeble understanding or feelings. And that's why heaven doesn't answer them. Hear me now. The Holy Spirit is God. What did I say he was? God. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. The Holy Spirit lives within you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? As the Holy Ghost dwelt in the mobile tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, as the Holy Spirit dwelt in uh, uh, Solomon's temple in the Holy of Holies, and Zerubbabel's temple in the Holy of Holies, and Herod's temple in the Holy of Holies, it was always pointing forward to Jesus who is our temple, and now he says... <coughs> that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Would you say there? Oh, beloved, hear me now. Uh, uh, he's your indwelling God. He, the Holy Spirit, is your resident teacher. He is your blessed illuminator. He is your divine tenant and helper. He is your divine comforter and counselor. He is your divine intercessor and mediator with the Lord Jesus Christ, who in turn then intercedes and mediates with God the Father on your behalf. And you ought to say, Amen. How can I lose when I have the Holy Ghost interceding for me and I have Jesus interceding for me? Would you say, Amen? You see, beloved, 
This is the most blessed Holy Trinity in unity, the thrice holy God and Godhead in one divine being, all three, every one, indivisible and triune God. Would you say amen? So I'm saying if there's anyone who can ever help you pray, if there's anyone who can ever connect you with heaven, if there's anyone who can ever convey your pleas and petitions to the throne of God, then it's the most blessed Holy Spirit who lives within you and just loves and wants and waits to want to help you do this. One day, the two and a half years of watching Christ work all kinds of supernatural miracles, his 12 apostles or disciples came to him and they asked him a profound question. They said, uh, or they didn't say, I should say, Lord, teach us how to do these type of miracles. They didn't say, Lord, how can we also heal the sick, raise the dead, or cast out demons? I get that sometimes. I say, how can we heal the dead, uh, raise the, uh, the demons, and <laughs> cast out sickness? Uh, but I get it confused. But anyways, beloved, they didn't say, Lord, by what means can we also calm the storms and walk on water? No way, beloved. They asked him this. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. Now, beloved, why did they do that? Because they'd often seen Jesus rise up early in the morning before dawn and go out into the mountains and pray for hours. And they said he'd go off in the evening and he'd go up into the mountains and he'd pray in the evening, hour after hour, beloved. And they knew that this is where he got his divine anointing from. This is where he got his divine power from. And they wanted it. They wanted to have power of the Holy Ghost upon them. They wanted to be able to beseech the throne of God so that when they did, God would turn his ear and dip it earthward and hear them and answer their prayers. Would you say amen? And so, beloved, they wanted that. So Jesus tells them and us that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus tells them and us to pray with importunity. That means with persistence. I didn't get what I prayed. Well, keep praying for it until he tells you not to do it. Jesus tells them and us that you must pray, believing you receive anything from God. So he said to them in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, he said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, what? Receiveth, he that seeketh, findeth. And them that keep on knocking, what does he do to them? He opens it to them, beloved. In other words, he's saying, learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen? Now, there's five truths I want to teach you about praying in the Holy Ghost and how He wants to revive your prayer life. Number one, the Holy Spirit divinely incites our prayer. The Holy Spirit divinely incites our prayer. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul exhorts us to pray without ceasing. Now, beloved, listen to me. I want you to get this now. Prayer, can somebody close this up? Uh, blind over here with the sun come right off the windshield. Blind. <laughs> Are you folks still here? <laughs> yeah, there you go, brother. I was in darkness, now we're in the light and I'm dark again. And I want you to hear me, beloved. Prayer is a spiritual exercise and work that is necessary for the Christian to do if he wants to stay in contact with God and ever receive anything from heaven. Do you hear what I said? It's one of the major ways you can be in contact with God so you can receive something from heaven. But humanly speaking, prayer, now listen to me, really challenges our normal and natural reasoning and intellect and logic. I want you to think about this. We're being told to pray and speak to an invisible deity that lives in an invisible realm who will answer our petitions in a visible and physical and tangible way. Now that's something else, isn't it? This defies all rational thinking and judgment on our part because we're being asked to do something that is not natural to us, but through faith it is now to be done supernaturally. You see, beloved, we live in a world where we contact and experience everything through our tactile senses. In other words, our senses of seeing and smelling and hearing and tasting and touching, that's how we make contact with the world. That's how we experience in the world. And to us, this is true reality. See, this is certainty. We can touch it. We can feel it. We can see it. We can smell it. But the Bible says the things that we cannot see are more real than the things that we can see. And those are the spiritual things, uh, of course, the Lord is speaking about. But then the Holy Spirit enters into our life. And when he does, he challenges and he changes this whole paradigm 
where we've always been so used to, beloved. He supernaturally goes to work in the deepest recesses of our heart and mind and soul and spirit, and he lays it on our innermost being to now want to talk to God. Not too many people really want to talk to God, but when you become a Christian, now you want. Want to talk to God. So he supernaturally moves and motivates us to want to talk to God. I'm saying he supernaturally prompts and provokes us to want to talk to God. I'm saying he supernaturally arouses us. He goads us, beloved, to now want to talk to God. He now gives us the compelling urge and the desire to pray. He now stirs and encourages and excites us to pray. He now initiates and stimulates us to pray. This is part of what it means to be praying in the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? The Holy Spirit morally and spiritually awakens in us and our deepest and innermost spiritual and transcendent senses, beloved, that have been dead until we got saved and to incite us to pray to God, to incite us to talk to God and to incite us to pray in the Holy Ghost. So that's point number one. Praying in the Holy Ghost, beloved, means that he's divinely inciting you to pray. Number two, the Holy Spirit divinely inspires our prayers. Do you know that praying can often be an exercise in futility unless you're inspired? I mean, inspiration can make you do a lot of things, can it? You see, beloved, James 5.16 says this, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now the words effectual, fervent, erga, energeo, that's the Greek word, it speaks of prayer that is effective, prayer that is successful and powerful with God, prayer that arrests the attention and moves God's heart to say, you know what, I'm now going to answer that person for what they're praying for. Now literally in the Greek, beloved, it means prayer that is supernaturally energized, empowered, and enabled by the Holy Ghost. It means prayer that is supernaturally, listen to me now, activated and actuated and animated by the Holy Spirit. It means prayer that is vibrant and dynamic, inspired by the Holy Ghost. This is praying in the Holy Ghost. You see, beloved, we're people who are inspired. It drives them, it compels them, it energizes and pushes them to do things far beyond their own known abilities and capabilities. Amen? We've seen that happen in our own lives, beloved. Just think of all the times in your life when you didn't think you could do something, but all of a sudden a fire got lit underneath, underneath you, and you got inspired, and you were able to do it. Amen? Let me give you an example. Many a composer, and I've read some of their biographies, Bach, Beethoven, uh, Tchaikovsky, Handel have been inspired and energized to write great concertos and music and symphonies they never dreamed that they were capable of doing. They said it just came to them, and they ended up writing right through the night and into the next day and not sleeping and not eating, and it just came to them. They were so inspired to do it. Many an artist like Michelangelo and Picasso and Van Gogh and Monet, beloved, have been energized and inspired to paint great masterpieces and works of art that were far beyond their own known talents. And many a preacher, beloved, many a preacher, preacher like Martin Luther, preachers like John Wesley and uh, George Whitfield, preachers like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon, beloved, were inspired and energized to preach great sermons that literally saved millions. Not only that, history tells us it started reformations and revivals, beloved, and they literally changed the face of Christianity. And yet these men thought it was not possible that God could ever use and anoint such an ordinary person as them to do such extraordinary things. And it's amazing, beloved, how God takes the hindmost. And he, I know he did that with me. I'm a hindmost type of a guy. I, have, I didn't have any advantages in life. Whatever I have has been what God has given to me, beloved. But I knew he put that fire in my belly to preach. The great evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, of the 19th century, was a humble shoe salesman. He was from Northfield, Massachusetts. But he was supernaturally anointed by the Holy Spirit and then used by God to preach the gospel and went around the world and virtually turned it upside down. 
And many a highly educated and refined pastor and preacher and theologian, they were bitterly jealous of him. You want to know why? Because here's a shoes salesman, kind of portly, and nevertheless he drew huge crowds and many converts were made. And these other people, the armchair theologians, refine, dignify, pronunciate, articulate, communicate. And yet, they did not have the anointing of the Holy Ghost on them, like Dwight L. Moody did. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, when the great and prestigious universities and seminaries of England, like Oxford, like Cambridge, like Westminster, invited him to preach an evangelistic campaign, campaign these highly respected and educated English divines protested. They said, how can you do such a thing? They said, why do we need this Moody here anyway? He's not educated like us. He's not experienced or articulate like us. So who does he think he is anyway? Does he think he has a monopoly on the Holy Ghost? Does he think he's the only one that has the Holy Spirit? And then in that biography it said an older and a wiser pastor responded and said this, No, Dwight L. Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on him. Would you say amen out there? Does he have it on you? Does the Holy Spirit have a monopoly on you? Oh, listen to me now. You see, beloved, the Holy Spirit knows that it's not the length, but the strength of your prayer that pleases God. And because of that, He supernaturally energizes our prayer. He animate, animates and strengthens our prayers, and He inspires our prayers. Why? Why does He do it? To help us. Why does He do it? To aid and assist us by moving us to pray with intense and fiery zeal and fervency and power and passion and enthusiasm. That, my friends, is praying in the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? Oh, God, help me. I need your help right now. You see, beloved, the Holy Ghost is moving when he does, uh, moving you to do that. Praying right from the depth of your soul. Would you say amen out there? Not talking about speaking in tongues here. You hear me now? Doing what only He can do, the Holy Spirit moves and motivates us to put our whole heart and soul into pouring out our prayers to God so He'll answer you. You see, beloved, God doesn't want our half-hearted prayers. God doesn't want prayer that's apathetic or indifferent. God does not want dispirited prayers, beloved. God wants us to pray with passion. God wants us to pray with power and energy. God wants us to pray with our whole heart so the Holy Spirit supernaturally inspires us to do this. So what have I said? Number one, the Holy Spirit divinely incites our prayers. Number two, the Holy Spirit divinely inspires our prayers. Number three, the Holy Spirit divinely influences our prayers. The Holy Spirit divinely influences our prayers. In a, a matching text, and the charismatics love to use this, and I'm telling you why, I, I, I'm, not against charism I'm not against the people, I'm against the movement because it's heresy. But Paul said this in Ephesians 5.18, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So the Pentecostal says, see, see, he's talking about speaking in tongues. Beloved, did you hear what that text said? Praying always with all prayer and supplications, deasis. Now, what does supplication mean? Supplication means to pray with specific requests mindfully and knowingly to God. In other words, it is you telling God what He wants. Every tongue speaker will tell you they don't have a clue what they're saying. But see, they don't take the words apart, and that's unfortunate, beloved, and they need a preacher to teach them how to do this. How shall they hear without a what? A preacher. And they need to take that word apotheosis and what it means. It means offering up mindfully, knowingly, willingly, verbally request unto God. It doesn't mean speaking some uh, gibberish or static speech. Now listen to me. The Holy Spirit helps us formulate and frame and structure our prayers so we can clearly verbalize and express them to God. In other words, He governs and guides our prayers. He leads and directs our prayers. He controls and regulates our prayers. Why? Why does he do that? He does that to point us in the right direction like a pilot does to a plane, or like a navigator or a skipper does to the ship. 
Their job is to keep us on course so we can arrive at our desired destination. Amen? Imagine a ship being out there without a rut or without a, 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 a navigator or a skipper to, uh, to guide it, to control the helm, or a plane. Who's at the control? <laughs> Nobody. We're just letting it land wherever it wants. <laughs> well, you see, beloved, that's what it means praying in the Holy Ghost. He's there to influence us because so, he knows exactly where we're going. Would you say amen out there? Therefore, beloved, I'm saying praying in the Holy Ghost is to pray in accordance and harmony with his leadings and with his pleadings and with his directing in our life. And he internally sways and influences us to construct and configure and arrange our prayers. How? How does he do it? Let me tell you how. By helping us pick and choose just the right words to plead and petition God with that expresses our deepest desires and needs and wants from Him. Beloved, that's praying in the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen? Now listen carefully. Without this divine influence by the Holy Spirit in our prayers, beloved, we would not know what to even say to God. You see, beloved, we would be tongue-tied. Our minds would be confused. And our soul would cry out in desperation from the burden of not knowing what to say to God. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't know anything about praying to God except what I was taught as a Catholic, to repeat these mindless prayers. But then, as I started growing as a Christian, he started teaching me how to pray. And of course, going to church will teach you a lot about how to pray. Ladies, did you know that most men really do not know how uh, to express how they really feel about you. you know. Isn't it hard, guys, sometimes to say that? And what's so ironic is this, that men are instinctively visual and women are instinctively verbal. They love, they want to hear those sweet words and nothings whispered in their ears. They love that, fellas. Now, you take King Solomon in the book of the uh, Song of Solomon, beloved, he really knew what to say to a woman to make the butter run. When expressing his deep love for the Shulamite woman and how beautiful she was, he chose just the right words he knew that she wanted to hear that would tickle her fancy and would arouse her love and desire for him. For example, now pay attention, fellas, you're going to learn something here. He said to her, thine eyes are like fish pools. Oh, Solomon, you shouldn't say such wonderful things. <laughs> Can't you hear it? He said to her, thy hair is like a flock of goats. Oh, Solomon, you have such a way with words. Beloved, he said to her, now listen, thy neck is as the Tower of David and thy nose is the Tower of Lebanon. Oh, you really know how to impress a woman, don't you, Solomon? Beloved, he said to her, thine head is like Mount Carmel, rock head. I, excuse me, I... I can hear her saying, come on, pour it on. He says, okay, baby, I'll tell you some more. He said to her, thy belly is as a heap of wheat. Now listen up, fellas, this guy really knows how to speak to a woman, okay. <laughs> he says, thy stature is like a palm tree. He says, and thy smell of your nose is like apples. <laughs> and then he concludes by saying, oh, how fair and pleasant thou art, my love and my beloved, and I can just hear her blushingly reply, Oh, Solomon, oh, Solomon. <laughs> Can't you see her? You shouldn't say such nice things about me. But I love it. <laughs> you see, beloved ladies, how'd you like your boy, or your husband, to say such things to you? Honey, I got to tell you right now, you're like a heap of wheat. <laughs> Honey, I got some good words for you. I just want you to know that your eyes are like fish pools. And your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> After you got up off the floor and she hit you with that roller pin. <laughs> Believe it or not, beloved, these words by King Solomon were considered great compliments and praises to a woman in his day. Today, if you said that, they'd scream hate speech, sexual abuse. But in Solomon's times, these were just the right words to make the Shulamite woman melt in his arms. And the book is clear on it. Listen to me, beloved. When you're praying in the Holy Ghost, 
He also helps you find and formulate just the right words to tickle God's fancy and make him melt in your arms so answer your prayers. So to ask the Holy Spirit to influence you in your prayers, by doing that, you are now praying in the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? And God is wrapping his arms around you. And God is saying, I love him, and I'm going to answer him. That's praying in the Holy Ghost. It is not sitting there, not understanding what you're saying, and going, there in 1 Corinthians 14, you're edifying yourself. They don't even see it, know the context of that. And it's sad, beloved. So, what do we see? The Holy Spirit divinely incites our prayers and inspires our prayers and influences our prayers. Number four, the Holy Spirit divinely instructs our prayers. He instructs our prayers. I told you he is our indwelling resident teacher and tutor. He's our indwelling instructor. He's our mentor. His job is to train, is to educate. His job is to coach. His job is to guide and advise us on how to pray and who to pray for and what to pray for. Oh, listen to me now. Listen to me now. Don't you miss this? You folks watching by television, don't you miss this? Praying in the Holy Ghost is not mechanically and mindlessly reciting written down prayers from rote, mem rote memory like the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Act of Contrition over and over and over and over again. That is not praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost is not saying the rosary or making a novena. These are man-made traditions. They have nothing to do with what the Scripture teaches. Praying in the Holy Ghost is not using vain repetitions and saying the same words over and the same things over and over and the same chants over and over again, thinking that this is going to help you be heard of God because it won't help you be heard of God. Jesus said that these were vain repetitions, that God loathes and hates and detests such empty and thoughtless prayers because they don't originate from your own mind don't originate from your heart filled with love and faith from God and they don't originate or ever express the deepest feelings and desires and needs that spring from your innermost being. You see, beloved, God is a person. Imagine me going up to Ellie. I am to say to you, I love you very much. You're my dearest one. I'll make supper. I am to say to you, you're my dearest one. You see, beloved, that's what, and people have been taught that that's prayer before God, and that's not prayer before God. I go up there and I say, listen, baby, I'm all shook up. <laughs> I ain't nothing but a hound dog, you know. <laughs> that means face like a dog, right? Uh, you see, beloved, what am I trying to say to you? I'm saying they're but mechanical prayers. They're what we call perfunctory or unthinking and careless prayers. And most people who pray like this think they're saving themselves by doing these pious works. You see, they've been taught, they've been deceived into believing that this pleases and earns brownie points with God when in actuality it really does not. In other words, if they're saying, you say 10 Our Fathers, 10 Hail Marys, 10 Act of a Contrition, you're pleasing God, God is writing brownie points down, boy, you're all covered for today. But that's not true, beloved. You see, he despises all such people in prayers. Enter the Holy Spirit. He now supernaturally teaches and enlightens and illuminates our heart, our mind, our soul, our spirit on how to pray to please God. As our indwelling divine instructor, he coaxes and gives us words to pray. He coaxes and gives us thoughts and scriptural promises to pray and scriptural principles to pray and burdens to pray. He coaxes and gives us the wherewithal to pray. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray, for he knows what kind of prayer pleases God, for he knows what kind of prayer God hears, for he knows kind of prayer God will answer in your life. Would you say amen out there? This is praying in the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? Okay, what do we learn? I got one more for you. I got 14 minutes. I'm going to take my time now. Can somebody give me some chili out there? What have I taught you so far? 
The Holy Spirit divinely incites our prayer, inspires our prayers, influences our prayers, instructs our prayers. And lastly, the Holy Spirit divinely intercedes in our prayers. Go to Romans chapter 8 now, if you would, please. Another text that is ripped out of context to made a pretext to try to defend something that's not real. Now, beloved, the experience, let me tell you this quickly. What people are passing off as speaking in things today, linguistic experts, when they record what a Christian, so the Christian religion speaking in tongues, the Buddhist speak in tongues, the Shinto speaks in tongues, pagans speak in tongues, the Mormons speak in tongues, and linguistic experts tell us it's nothing but the repetitious syllable over and over again, and there's no difference between what the Christian says or the Buddhist says. There's no difference between what the Shinto says or what the Tibetan says when he speaks in tongues. It's all the same. Now, there are languages of the world, and if you've ever heard Vietnamese, okay, that, I'm, I'm giving you some good words there. That means Pastor Joel's a great preacher. <laughs> they used to say to me, Buku dinky dao, Buku dinky dao. You know what that means? They used to look at me and say, You're plenty crazy. <laughs> You're plenty crazy. Buku dinky dao, Buku dinky dao. Or they say, Didi mao, Didi mao, get out of here, get out of here. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts, that's God, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, beloved, look at your text in verse 26. The word intercession is a big word. Hupa entugano is that Greek word, and it means that the Holy Spirit acts on our behalf as our mediator with Christ and God when we pray, when we do not know what to say. In other words, when we're ignorant and we don't know what we ought to pray for as we ought, the Holy Spirit always does. In other words, he automatically steps up to the plate and he does it for us. Now in verse 27, it says he always prays for us, notice, according to the will of God, so God will answer our prayers. And then in verse 26, the Holy Spirit helps our asthenia, our infirmities. That is our weakness and feebleness and flaws when we pray because we don't know what to say to God. Now, beloved, how does he do this? Well, Paul says in verse, 20, in verse 26, through groanings. Now, that word groanings, uh, stenagmos, means this. Now, listen. With deep and inexpressible and unutterable groans, sighs, and cries that he does this, and he's praying to God according to his will on our behalf in a way that only him and God understands. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, this does not refer to speaking in tongues as the Pentecostals and Charismatics believe and teach. For Paul says these groans cannot be uttered by us. This word stenagmos, that is to groan, is used some three times in the context here. Let's take a quick look. Number one, in verse 22, it says creation groans. Same word, for we know that the whole creation, stenagmos, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, beloved, this means that like a woman suffering labor pains who's about to have her baby, the whole of creation also suffers and groans together with man waiting to be delivered from the curse that was placed upon it by the fall of Adam and Eve. So it does not mean that all of creation is speaking in tongues. Okay, it's groaning. You know when you heard, oh, oh, man, oh, oh. No, I... I, I want you to people remember to, to understand the text, you need to understand the context. So the first thing we see is that creation groans. Number two, Paul shows us that the Christian groans. Look what he says in verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, us Christians, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, an agmos, groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. In other words, we also want to be delivered from the curse of the sinful sufferings and corruptions of this mortal flesh. 
We're looking for that day when we'll have sinless perfection, when we'll live in the eternal state in an immortal and glorified body because Jesus will come back and reveal the curse. Would you say amen out there? So till then, we're groaning. Stenagmos, that's the word. And thirdly, we see right here, beloved, in verse 26, that the Spirit groans. He says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for ours as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, beloved, listen very carefully. I'm giving you a, a theology class here. I want to tell you what this means. If you went to seminary, uh, this is what I uh, seminary, this is what you would have learned. This refers to the inter-Trinitarian speaking and communication that's going on that occurs between the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, not us. It's not us that are doing the groaning. It's who? The Holy Spirit that's doing the groanings. Now, beloved, these inaudible. These quiet and soundless groans and sighs and cries by the Holy Spirit express His deepest emotions for us when He intercedes to God and prays for us because He is our mediator to Jesus who turns around and mediates before the Father. What would you say amen out there? See, beloved, that's praying in the Holy Ghost. Nowhere does this touch that any of these things teach that this means to speak in tongues. It doesn't mean creation is speaking in tongues. It doesn't mean the Spirit is speaking in tongues. It doesn't mean Christians are speaking in tongues. That's a man-made doctrine, and it's based on an experience, and people will say something like this. A man with an experience doesn't have to worry about what anything else says. Well, have you ever had a false experience? I have. I've had all kinds of false experiences, beloved, but that's not true. I do not base my theology on my experience. I base my experience on the infallible, inerrant, eternal Word of God. Would you say amen out there? Now, either you want to know the truth and be set free, or you want to stay in bondage because you have an experience. Now, look at verse 27. And he, God, that searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, not you, because he maketh intercession for the saints, that's you, according to the will of God. Now, the word searcheth, erinao, means that God constantly and continuously investigates, examines, inspects man's heart to see what's truly in it and to see what uh, he truly is and what he needs. And seeing that he also lives in us by the indwelling Holy Spirit, beloved, notice it says he knoweth. That word knoweth, ido, means that he always knows our true moral and spiritual state and status and the true verity of our real needs and pleads before God. Why? Because he says here he knows what is in the mind. That word mind, phronema, means what's in the divine thoughts or purposes and direction of the Holy Spirit's mind about us. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, this is an inter-Trinitarian and supernatural work, and it's done on a spiritual level within the Godhead, which the believer has nothing to do with. So this is praying in the Holy Ghost. He is our intercessor, our mediator, who brings what he knows is our real and true and actual and genuine and needful prayers and pleadings and petitions before God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit always prays according to the will of God. And not according to our own selfish wants or wishes or will that may be far out of agreement and alignment and accord with what God's will is. Amen? So the Holy Spirit leads us to pray in accordance with and harmony with God's will and not our own agenda or scheme or plans that we may have. In this way, he supernaturally inspects and corrects and perfects our prayers, and he checks and redirects and protects us from the contrary things that may hurt and harm our soul and ruin and make shipwreck of our faith. In other words, he'll say something like this, as God searches his mind. That's not what they really want when he just prayed. See, he doesn't even know what he wants. I know what he wants, and God says, I know that you know. But somewhere along the line, you're going to have to show him the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so you know what he does? He puts something out to dress you down. I'm a what? You, uh, see, your brother didn't have, your brother didn't have a, uh, 
the guts to tell you that because you know you couldn't take it. So God puts an unsafe person in your path. You're a blankety, blankety, blank, and blank, and a blankety, blank. Blank. And the Holy Spirit says, you better listen to him. <laughs> he didn't say it the way I would, but... <laughs> You see, beloved, that's praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Although we as believers, beloved, we don't always know how to pray according to God's divine and perfect will. The Holy Spirit certainly does. So he who knows the deepest needs and desires of the heart, then even we're not aware of, nor could be able to express with our words, the Holy Spirit now intercedes and does it for us with unspeakable groans to God that he understands because they're too deep for us to humanly articulate. See, beloved, Paul was caught up to the third heaven. The Bible says he heard words that were unspeakable. He couldn't even speak them. So this is what it's talking about. It's not talking about speaking with tongues. Would you say amen out there? So the Holy Spirit carries these profound appeals, uh, and he makes for us with, uh, as believers to God in a thoughtful and a mindful language that only the Godhead understands. And what's unbelievable to me as a pastor and a theologian is verse 27, beloved. It says that no words are necessary to be spoken by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it says the Father who searches his mind always knows and agrees with what the Holy Spirit thinks and petitions. So I exhort you in Colossians 4, 2 to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Oh, man, I got two minutes. Well, let me conclude. So what have we learned about praying in the Holy Ghost? Namely that, number one, the Holy Spirit divinely incites our prayers. That's praying in the Holy Ghost. Number two, we have learned that the Holy Spirit divinely inspires and influences our prayers. That's two and three if you're not counting. Don't take your shoes off, Tom. Number four, beloved, he divinely instructs. And number five, he divinely intercedes in our prayers. And beloved, that's what it biblically means to pray in the Holy Ghost. The question is, are you praying in the Holy Ghost? Do you have a robust prayer life? Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. So I ask you, beloved, do you say, Holy Spirit, help me pray? How can I say this? What is it you want in my life? What's God's will in this matter? When you do that, you are now doing more. Say it. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Not praying in tongues. You're praying in the Holy Ghost. So contrary to what the Pentecostal and charismatic movement uh, teaches, bless their heart, the fact of the matter is they misinterpret Ephesians 6.18 and Romans 8.26 and 27. They don't look at the context like we did to see about creation groans, the Christian groans, and the spirit groans. None of them mean speaking in tongues. I hope that's been a blessing to you. I've never been so close to my notes in my life. <laughs>